um, today we're going to be talking about PrEP, which is HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis for primary care settings. Um, we also uh, wanted to let you know that we do have uh, more um, presentations that will be coming up throughout the year from now till June. Um, and we do have two workshops coming up, one in March, one in June, um, which we call Let's Talk About Sex. It's an LGBTQIA plus health workshop and taking a sexual history. Um, so this will be our third and fourth um, time doing these workshops. They're half day um, and they've been really fun. So we hope to see some of you there. Um, next month, we'll be talking about STI diagnosis and treatment, and then in April, we'll be discussing syphilis, and in May, hep C for primary care. So as clinician ambassadors, just a brief overview, what we do um, is serve as a resource for clinicians in the uh, Bear County in the San Antonio Metroplex, um, and our goal is to improve public health through outreach and communication. Um, and so we are available for in-person and virtual one-on-one -on -one and group discussions, educational presentations, and assistance um, in implementing evidence-based practices. So we can be reached. This is our contact information here. And you can also sign up um, using the provider interest form. As far as conflicts of interest, we don't have any conflicts to disclose. Um, and HRSA is uh, supporting this program. Um, and so our views expressed in this presentation do not re necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, unconscious bias disclosure. Um, do, do I need to read the whole thing, uh, Maria? Okay, there is that. Um, and so for our objectives for today, um, by the end of this presentation, we hope that you'll be able to define pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis and identify the differences. Recognize available PrEP regimens, because there are um, more than one, and associate each with the appropriate patients. Determine which baseline tests should occur prior to initiating PrEP and which patients require follow-up testing. Also, uh, we'll provide you with some resources uh, for up-to-date evidence-based information regarding PrEP and PEP. So jumping right into some statistics, um, there were 36,136 uh, people in the US that were diagnosed in uh, 2021 with HIV. Nationally, um, diagnoses did fall between 2017 and 2021, but Bear County's incidence uh, rate has been flat. Um, each new diagnosis, of course, is one that possibly could have been prevented. And PrEP prescribing has increased every year since 2012 when the drugs were first approved. Um, but again, they're not being, they're very much underutilized. In 2021, uh, 1.2 million adults and adolescents had indications for PrEP, yet only 30% were prescribed PrEP. And of course, there's equity issues with PrEP prescribing as well. Um, equitable provision uh, among populations with the highest risks um, is not occurring. So among those are Black and Hispanic men who have sex with men and Black women. Black people represented 14% of PrEP users, but 42% of HIV diagnosis. And Hispanic Latinx people represented 17% of PrEP users and 27% of the new diagnoses. White people, however, represented 64% of PrEP users and just 26% of the new diagnoses. And then finally, PrEP for HIV prevention in people who are at risk is effective and safe in reducing HIV transmission. In Bear County in 2021, we had 7,577 people living with HIV, 83.5% of those were male, 16.5% of those were female, 53% were 45 and older, and 43% were 25 to 44. There were 349 new diagnoses of HIV. Again, all probably preventable. So we're aiming to meet the 95-95-95 goal. Um, I feel like I said that four times, but 95-95-95 goal, an ambitious goal uh, to help in the AIDS epidemic worldwide. 95% of people will, with HIV will know their HIV status. 95% will receive, get into therapy and sus be sustained in therapy. 
Um, and then 95% of people in therapy will have viral suppression. In San Antonio, in the greater Metroplex, we are at 83, 72, and 89% respectively. So we are getting close, but there's still work that needs to be done. So in our efforts to reach the target of zero HIV, we need to make sure that we emphasize that HIV is preventable with safe, effective medications. That's PrEP. And people with HIV are now living long, healthy lives um, when they start treatment early and stay in care. We can treat HIV just as any other chronic condition like diabetes or heart failure. It can be managed uh, with, the, with the correct medications. We want to emphasize to people who are diagnosed that undetectable equals untransmittable or U equals U. When a patient is undetectable with their viral load um, so that it's no longer detected in the blood, they're untransmittable, which means that they once they have that undetectable viral load for at least six months, they can no longer transmit the virus through sex, even condomless sex. Um, and remember, as providers, that HIV stigma hurts and spreads the disease. So we have a duty to interrupt stigma when and wherever we see it. So this is just a reflection question. Um, and I know that more and more providers are starting to do this, but do you include a sexual history as a routine part of your patient health history? Um, and I know when I first started doing this, a lot of providers did not. But again, like I said, I'm, I'm starting to see more and more providers do a brief um, sexual history that's very targeted in their um, in their visits with their patients. So let's talk about PrEP. So there's two approved, uh, FDA approved oral PrEP regimens. One is intracitabine with tenofovir disaproxyl fumarate, TDF, or uh, tenofovir alafenamide, TAF. So they're both two medication combination regimens. They're daily fixed dose medications um, they consist of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. They're 99% effective in preventing HIV acquisition through sex, and about 74% effective in preventing HIV through injection drug use. These medications reach maximal effectiveness seven days after initiation for receptive anal sex and 21 days after initiation for receptive vaginal sex. And so these are the oral preparations, dosing, frequency, and the most common side effects. As you can see, they're both once daily dosing, um, consisting of those two medications in one tablet. Most commonly, the side effects have been mild and generally ease over time, and they included headache, nausea, abdominal discomfort, and for FTAF, uh, there was some reports of weight gain as well. And there's more. When we use PrEP, and combine it with other ways to prevent HIV infections like condom use and regular STD testing, it's even more effective. So we always encourage our patients to um, go ahead and double up, use the condoms as well, um, get tested regularly, which is built into PrEP care, um, and then getting drug and alcohol use treatment um, when that's needed. And um, for people who do uh, get HIV, get them into treatment as well so that we can reduce their viral loads and get them undetectable and untransmittable. This is an algorithm that's helpful for when you're assessing a patient for, um, for PrEP use. The primary question that we want to be asking our patients is, are they having sex? If they're not sexually active, then we don't need to go any further with these questions. But if they are, and if they've had sex in the last six months, then you would go ahead and go down the algorithm. Um, and there are many indications for uh, PrEP, and I will go over those in just a few. This is a similar slide for patients who inject drugs um, and who are at risk for HIV through that uh, risk activity. So the USPSTF recommends uh, PrEP uh, for, the, for adolescents and adults at increased risk. They recommend prescribing PrEP, um, and they give it an A grade. So um, the ACA, ACA um, Affordable Care Act requires most insurance plans um, to cover uh, the cost of A recommendations. So how do we determine that increased risk? Um, well, it's going to be adults and adolescents who have had anal or vaginal sex in the last six months and one or more of the following. 
an HIV positive partner or more than one partner with unknown status of HIV, bacterially transmitted sexual infections, I said that really backwards, bacterial <laughs> sexually transmitted infections or STIs in the last six months. So if you diagnose someone with chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis in the last six months, they have indications for PrEP and inconsistent condom use. Um, also people who inject drugs or share injection equipment have an indication for PrEP. So reaching back to what I just went over as far as maximal effect after initiation, this is our first knowledge check. How long does it take for oral PrEP to reach maximal effect after initiation? And the hint here is that there are two answers. Does anybody want to take a guess? You can either put your answer in the chat or come off mute. No one? Okay. Um, so the answer is seven days for receptive anal sex and 21 days for receptive vaginal sex. Now, just to note here, and I'll, I'll repeat this over um, the next few slides, is that for injectable PrEP, the maximal effectiveness, uh, the time to maximal effectiveness is still unknown. Um, and for IV drug use, time to maximal effectiveness for oral regimens is believed to be about 28 days. Okay, so um, speaking of injectable PrEP, um, it's intramuscular cabotegravir or CAB. Um, it was FDA approved in 2021, and it's an integrase strand transfer inhibitor in C. According to a study uh, cited by the NIH, CAB had a superior protective effect versus oral PrEP and may be desi more desirable to some of our patients. Um, it consists of one injection in the gluteal muscle every eight weeks. Um, and it's administered in the provider's office, and the ventral gluteal site is the preferred site of administration. Again, the time to maximal effectiveness uh, for this particular medication is still unknown. So cabotegravir is indicated for adults and adolescents who have increased risk of exposure and acquisition for HIV, um, who prefer that injectable medication where they don't have to take a pill every day. Um, sexually active adults with a history of anal vaginal sex in the last six months and any of the following. Same as before, have an HIV positive sexual partner, especially if their partner's uh, viral load is unknown or undetectable, I'm sorry, unknown or detectable. And uh, bacterial uh, STI in the past six months. So if they've been diagnosed with chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, um, or another bacterial STI and a history of inconsistent or no condom use. And then of course, our patients who inject drugs also have indication if they have an HIV positive injecting partner or share equipment. Other considerations for CAB for PrEP um, still includes cost. Um, they are still relatively expensive um, and may need to be ordered from specialty pharmacies or given at infusion centers. Um, they do not require refrigeration anymore. I know initially they were saying that they did, but um, they, they do not require refrigeration. These medications do have a long pharmacokinetic tail. So um, if the patient, once they're on it, it can stay in the body for at least 12 months, which leads to the possibility of um, developing resistant HIV. Um, we don't know how uh, much of a risk is involved with that, but when we discontinue patients off of injectable PrEP, uh, we want to make sure that we're having this conversation with them and transition them to oral prep um, and do keep doing that HIV testing quarterly for at least a year. Um, and uh, there is also not a lot of data for injectable prep in patients that are under 18 or in pregnancy. Um, so also when we start patients on prep, we have two options for how we start them. I'm going to go ahead and hop to the next page. Um, so we can either do an oral lead-in um, where we are going to give oral cabotegravir for 28 days before we start injections, or we can just start the injections. Either way, once we start the injections, um, we're going to give them for initial for the initial dosing, we're going to give an injection for month one, follow up with another injection for month two, 
And then after that, it's every two months they would get an injection. The recommended um, dose for the lead-in is 30 milligrams of cabotegravir daily. And the first injection, if we're going to do the oral lead-in, should be on the last day of the oral lead-in, um, if possible. So who do we give which PrEP? I know I had mentioned um, cabotegravir not having a lot of data available for use in people under 18 or for pregnancy. So we'll talk a little bit about which PrEP is appropriate for which patients. So we wanna educate all of our sexually active patients um, about PrEP as an effective means for HIV prevention. Um, but which PrEP goes to which patients depends on several variables. It includes age, weight, gender, sexual practices or injection drug use, renal function in some cases, and barriers to adherence if uh, to daily medications. So for oral um, emcitritabine plus tenofovir alafenamide, FTAF, or FTDF, um, we are going to consider it for sexually active adults and adolescents who have that elevated risk for whom all of the following apply. They have to have a documented negative HIV antigen antibody test in the last seven days before initial prescription, no signs of sy or symptoms of acute HIV, and they need to have an estimated creatinine clearance of 30 uh, milliliters per minute for FTAF or 60 milliliters per minute for FTDF. And they cannot be on any of the contraindicated medications. For FTDF, this medication is approved by the FDA um, and appropriate for most patients who are eligible for PrEP. This is the most commonly prescribed regimen. Um, so, for adolescents, they just need to weigh at least 35 kilograms or 77 pounds. Um, and this is the recommended regimen for people who inject drugs. Um, it's available in a generic version and the creatinine clearance needs to be at least 60 mils per minute. Um, this is also the regimen that's recommended for PrEP during pregnancy. And um, these medications have been used to safely treat HIV during pregnancy and lactation. It's the same medications, um, and there's been no reports of birth defects caused by oral PrEP. Also, there's small amounts of the medication that have been found in breast milk, but there's been no evidence that they've harmed the baby. For FTAF, this medication is appropriate for men and transgender women with that um, elevated risk of HIV acquisition through sex. Uh, it's not approved for women uh, who are at risk through receptive vaginal sex. Um, and for those patients, FTDF should be prescribed instead. Um, it's approved for use in patients with an estimated creatinine clearance of less than 60 mils per minute, but at least 30 mils per minute. Um, and for this particular formulation, there is no generic at this time. So interactions for PrEP, uh, oral PrEP uh, is on this table here. There's not a whole lot of medications that they think um, have significant effects. However, we should not be co-administering um, oral PrEP with adefavir. Um, or uh, St. John's wort, rifampin, rifabutin, or rifapantene. Uh, as far as feminizing hormones, spironolactone and estrogens, um, they, there is some evidence that for TDF, it may lower uh, the availability of PrEP in the rectal tissues, um, but it's still unknown if it affects PrEP effectiveness. Did I skip a slide? I think I did. Sorry, I skipped a slide, skipped several slides. Okay, so for eligibility for injectable PrEP, uh, sexually active adults, again, um, should have that documented negative HIV test in the last seven days, no signs or symptoms of acute HIV, and no contraindicated med medications or health conditions. Do not administer or prescribe um, other antiretrovirals in combination with CAB for PrEP, um, and do not administer CAB injections at any site other than the gluteal muscle just because of the pharmacokinetics 
um, and drug absorption at other injection sites is unknown. Um, patients should not be getting the injections for use at home. They need to come into the provider's office to get their medication. And um, CAB oral daily medication regimens are should not be prescribed other than for the lead-in and that and for restarting prep injections. And again, that should only be for that 28 day period. Um, during pregnancy or breastfeeding, this information is still evolving, um, but generally for pregnant patients, um, it's recommended to go with the FTDF. Interactions for CAV, um, we shouldn't in co-administer with anticonvulsants, so carbamazepine, oxycarbazepine, phenobarbital, phenytoin, or antimycobacterials, so rifampin, rifapantine. Um, these all decrease the effect of CAB um, concentrations. And for there's no known uh, effects for hormonal contraceptives, uh, so levonorgestrel or ethanol est estradiol um, contraceptives should be fine, also feminizing hormones. So we've reached our second knowledge check. Um, which oral prep regimen would be prescribed for a cisgender female patient who has increased risk for HIV acquisition through receptive vaginal sex and has a creatinine clearance greater than 60 mils per minute? Don't be shy, you can unmute or type your answer in the chat. Hope has put in the chat FTDF. That's right. Yes. FTDF. Um, this is the only oral regimen that's approved for use in women. Um, the only other option is a CAB, which is not an oral med, but um, and and that's only if they're not pregnant or breastfeeding. So again, getting that sexual history as well as any um, pregnancy intentions is important in our female uh, patients who have uh, receptive vaginal sex. Um, would your decision differ if this same patient also reported use of intravenous drugs? No. That's right. It wouldn't. It would still be the FTDF. Thank you. All right. So financial support. Um, there are several options for getting PrEP covered for oral regimens. Uh, most insurance plans and uh, Medicaid programs cover at least one form of PrEP. Um, the Ready, Set, PrEP program offers um, the medications available at no cost um, for patients who qualify. There are copay um, and uninsured assistance programs that help lower the cost of medications. Um, and then starting in January of 2021, most private insurance plans had to provide zero cost copy zero dollar cost sharing uh, for at least one prep product. So most patients should not need these copay assistance programs. It's generally just our patients that um, may not have um, uh, insurance or they may be underinsured. And then NASTAD, uh, there's a, they have a prep coverage check for ACA marketplace plans to show which ones cover um, prep. For CAB, um, there's a lot fewer options for financial support. Uh, there's the medication assistance program through the manufacturer, uh, which I believe is vivconnect.com. They have a savings program or a patient assistance program there. Um, but USTF, uh, USPSTF does give a grade A recommendation as of August, 2023 to injectable prep as well. So it should start to be covered by insurance programs. Now, some providers have been a little off put about uh, the required testing um, with PrEP uh, for baseline and then follow-up, but they've actually made some changes to the requirements for that recently. And it's not, um, it, it's a little bit less involved than it, I think it used to be at one time. So for baseline, um, for oral PrEP regimens, you do need your uh, baseline creatinine clearance, and that's gonna be calculated from the creatinine and ideal body weight. Um, you need hepatitis B and C testing. Um, you need HIV testing using a fourth generation antigen antibody test. 
and an HIV or in a PCR if there are signs and symptoms of acute HIV because we can't start someone on PrEP if they have a possibility of being HIV positive. They need to be on antiretroviral therapy. Um, and then we do STI screening, so testing for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, um, and then urine HCG for patients who could possibly be pregnant. For CAB prep, the injectable prep, um, the following tests are really not indicated prior to starting CAB or for monitoring while they're using CAB. So the creatinine, estimated creatinine clearance, hep B serology, lipid panels, or liver function tests. None of these are required to start your patient or monitor them while they're on injectable prep. So if the injectable version really does um, have some benefits. It's just a matter of getting them covered. Um, there's no data available yet for clinical trials in men or women that estimate the time from CAB injections to maximal protection, which I said before. All right, and so for the follow-up diagnostics, I'm going to hand it over to Diana, um, and she's going to take it from here. Awesome. Thank you, Lucinda. I also apologize as well. I'm also a little sick, so thank you guys for just being so patient with us. Okay, so we'll start with follow-up diagnostics. So whenever you have your patients for their follow-up visits, we go to the next slide. Medication adherence counseling is gonna be very vital. So here we have a picture from the CDC 2021 PrEP guidelines. So extremely important with your patients that you're establishing trust with them, bi-directional communication, providing simple explanations and education. So whenever you're seeing them on those appointments, you wanna go over the common side effects, go over relationship of adherence to the efficiency of PrEP, go over the signs and symptoms of acute HIV infection and recommended actions. You also wanna support that they continue staying on PrEP. So tailor that daily dose to patient's daily routine, identify reminders and devices to minimize forgetting doses. So maybe telling them to set alarms on their phone. There's certain apps they can use to remind them to take those doses. Maybe identify some barriers to why they aren't wanting to adhere to the medication and reinforce benefit relative to uncommon harms. Also important to monitor medication adherence in a non-judgmental manner. So normalize occasional missed doses while ensuring the patient understands the importance of daily dosing, reinforce success, and assess any side effects they may be experiencing, and figure out a plan on how to manage them. So a brief medication adherence question you may want to ask is, many people find it difficult to take a medication daily. Thinking about your last week, how many of those days have you not taken your medication? Just so you can have a general idea of how it's going for them and they can talk a little bit more in depth with you about it. So next slide. So now we'll go into the follow-up recommendations for oral prep. So for oral prep recommended every three months, you're gonna do a fourth generation HIV um, antigen antibody test and the HIV RNA PCR and you'll assess for acute HIV signs and symptoms. You'll also do STI screening, so chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, um, testing for MSM and transgender women who have sex with men. You also provide risk reduction education, including access to sterile needles, drug treatment services if applicable, and provide a prescription or refill authorization of daily oral PrEP medication for less than those 90 days. Okay, and next slide. So here we'll go into the follow-up recommendations for oral PrEP. So after those three months, uh, what's recommended every six months is to evaluate for signs and symptoms of acute HIV, checking renal function for those over 50 years of age or creatinine clearance um, less than 90 mLs a minute. You'll do your STI screenings, gonorrhea, chlamydia for all sexually active patients. So chlamydia for men who have sex with men and for transgender women and screen oral, rectal, urine as indicated and blood. And then recommended every 12 months, you'll evaluate for signs and symptoms of acute HIV, renal function for all patients, and STI screening, so gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis for all patients. And then for those patients that are on the oral FTAF, you'll be assessing their weight, triglycerides, and lipids. See you next slide. So now that we already went over the oral follow-up, we'll now look at the injectable. So for CAV, this is the follow-up. Recommended within 30 days after the starting the patient on the injectable, you want to get that HIV antigen antibody test and an HIV RNA PCR. 
So beginning with the third injection following every two months, it should include, again, the same testing as the first one. And then you'll also want to assess for sterile needles and syringes and drug treatment programs, if applicable. And then beginning with the third injection, follow-up every four months should include checking for signs and symptoms of acute HIV, HIV antigen, antibody, and RNA PCR testing, STI screening for MSM and transgender women who have sex with men, so checking oral, rectal, urine, and blood, and risk reduction education and access to sterile needles or drug treatment services if applicable. Okay, and then our next one. And then for the last slide on follow-up for the injectable prep. So beginning with the fifth injection, the following are recommended every six months. So screening for bacterial STIs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and for all heterosexual, heterosexually active men and women. So screen oral, rectal, urine, as indicated by sexual exposure and blood for syphilis. And then for the following are recommended every 12 months. So you'll assess their desire to continue with PrEP injection, and you'll also be screening for bacterial STIs, um, including chlamydia and heterosexual, heterosexual active people, even if asymptomatic. Next slide, please. So whenever a patient has decided that they want to discontinue the injections, there's a couple things we need to go through with them. So you want to educate them on the pharmacokinetics and the risk of resistant HIV. I think Lucinda had already mentioned it, but basically the half-life of CAB, it's unknown and it's really long. So there is that risk for basically them developing a drug-resistant strain of HIV infection during that time period. So let them know of that risk. You're also going to want to assess for ongoing risk reduction and plans to prevent HIV. So again, recommend using condoms, possibly consider PrEP, which would be the third one, prescribe oral PrEP for at least 12 months for those with the ongoing risk, and then HIV testing quarterly for one year, including that RNA test. Next slide, please. So why should you consider prescribing PrEP in, your, PrEP in your practice? So primary care is the perfect environment for prescribing PrEP. A majority of surveyed patients want their primary care providers to address sexual health. Taking a brief sexual history as part of the regular physical exam allows patients to ask questions and get sound information from a reliable, knowledgeable source, which is you. And PrEP is underprescribed. Only 24% of Bexar County residents who had indications for PrEP were prescribed it in 2022. It's also easy to prescribe PrEP and monitor and is free for your patients under most insurance plans, including required tests and follow-up visits. And it's a major part of the plan to end HIV in the US globally. Okay, next slide. So does PrEP, equal more unsafe sex. So maybe a major study shows otherwise, but consider this, it's still loading, <laughs> but consider this, PrEP requires STI testing every three months. So while they're on PrEP, they're gonna be tested for those bacterial STIs. Therefore, we're more likely to catch some infections earlier had they not been on it. Next slide, please. So let's do a case study, guys. So this is case study at number one. This is John. So John is a 38-year-old CIS gender male. Chief complaint is initiation of oral prep, sexual history, two male partners in the last six months. Last sexual encounter was one month ago. The partner's HIV status is unknown. Their last HIV test was negative. That was a year ago. Vaccines are up to date, review of symptoms. John reports a recent onset of fatigue, shortness of breath, and swollen lymph nodes for approximately two weeks, which he attributes to getting his flu and COVID, uh, COVID vaccines last month. Oral PrEP baseline labs were obtained, and we can look at them below. So our CMP, creatine, uh, creatine clearance is 103, Hep B and C negative, HIV antigen and antibody negative. I'll give you a second for you guys to look at that while I get a sip of water. <laughs> So next slide. So based on the patient's clinical presentation, the provider should A, initiate PrEP, 
B, initiate PrEP, repeat HIV antigen antibody testing in one month, or C, conduct HIV RNA assay, do not initiate PrEP. So A, B, or C, you guys can discuss. Feel free to unmute or even include in the chat what you think we should do. Let's see, any responses yet? Yes, sorry, I have two screens going here. Um, Hope says C, but you can also initiate. She says she would get an HIV RNA while starting prep. Uh, someone else says A. Okay, we're kind of spread across. Okay, so we can go to the next slide and then we can talk about it, guys. Okay, so based on this patient's clinical presentation for John, the patient should, or the provider should, conduct the HIV RNA assay, do not initiate PrEP. So that is because John is showing some acute HIV infection based on some of his symptoms, which he's attributing to, towards his vaccine, but we as providers, we have to be careful with that. So let's discuss. If John's HIV RNA PCR test returns a negative result, can he then be started on PrEP? Why or why not? And you guys can type up what y'all think or you can unmute. So Rita says yes, because of signs C. Okay, any other responses? Uh, Hope says repeat in two to four weeks, can start prep, just can just switch to full regimen if zero converts. Okay, so let's go to our next slide and we can discuss a little bit more. So for patients with signs and symptoms, such as like John, of acute HIV infection within the past four weeks, the results, the following options are suggested. So test the patient with a combination of antibody antigen assay, ideally with a laboratory-based method. If the test is non-reactive, negative, PrEP can be initiated. Also test the patient with a viral load. If the patient has a measurable viral load of less than 3,000, infection is unlikely, but PrEP should be deferred while testing is repeated. If the viral load is below the level of detection of the assay and the patient has no signs and symptoms on that day, PrEP can be initiated. And then defer PrEP and retest patient for HIV antibody in one month. Okay, awesome. And then next slide. So here we can see a um, little bit of a flow chart helps providers at looking at HIV status for PrEP provision to people without recent antiretroviral prophylaxis use. This can be very useful. I recommend taking a picture of this or saving this. And then we have another one on the next slide and we can follow through. Let's see. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then for this one, this will help providers determining HIV status for PrEP provision to people with recent or ongoing antiretroviral prophylaxis use. So both of them, I highly recommend you guys save. And then we'll jump into the next one. Now we have case study number two, Jenny. And sorry to interrupt, we'll be, the slides are gonna be sent out as well. So you will have those um, algorithms for your use. Thank you, Lucinda. Okay, so now we have Janie, case study number two. So Janie is a 20 year old CIS gendered female. You received the following lab results for Janie who is here for her first prep appointment. So we have our initial HIV, which is our antibody antigen test result. It's reactive. We have our HIV antibody differential. That's going to be non-reactive. And our HIV NAT, which is negative. Um, she is negative for symptoms consistent with acute HIV at the time of the appointment. So how should the provider interpret these results? A, Janie has a false positive screening, delay initiating PrEP and repeat testing in one month. B, Janie had a false positive screening test, initiate PrEP and retest in a month. C, Janie has acute HIV, delaying initiating PrEP and retest in a month. Or D, none of the above. All right, guys, and y'all can message in the chat what exactly is happening with Janie, what should we do? Let's see, get a PCR viral load. 
can start maintaining close contact retest two to four weeks. Okay, good job. <laughs> so we can go to the next one. Good job, Hope. So Jamie had a false positive screening test. You can initiate prep and yes, retest in a month. Good job, guys. Okay, so now we're gonna go into event-driven prep. So ED prep. And next slide, please. This is gonna be known as what you guys are pretty, are, which are pretty familiar with is the 211 protocol, also called intermittent, on-demand, event-driven, or ED prep. Um, so basically, this is not something that is a part of CDC's guidelines for prep use. Taking prep once daily is currently the only FDA approved schedule for taking prep to prevent HIV, but this is effective and we'll go into depth on it. So consistent, this 211 approach consists of a double dose. So two pills, which serve as the loading dose of the TDF FTC between two to between two to 24 hours in advance of sex, then a third pill 24 hours after the first two pills, and then a fourth pill 48 hours after the first two pills. That's why it's the 211 dosing. A term that can be used to communicate this approach um, as an alternative to daily dosing for men who have sex with men. This is not FDA approved. It is 86% effective. Okay, and then here we have an algorithm. This way it can help determine discussing this uh, event-driven dosing or even discussing daily dosing. What's very helpful about this is if somebody is interested in event-driven dosing and they would qualify for PrEP, then they can bounce between so they can get onto daily dosing. Okay, next one, please. Post-exposure prophylaxis, which is PEP. We'll go into depth on that right now. So what is PEP? Post-exposure prophylaxis is the use of antiretroviral drugs after a single high-risk event to stop HIV seroversion should be used only in emergency situations and should be started within 72 hours after a recent possible exposure to HIV and prescribed for a full 28 days. So for those who are at ongoing risk of HIV, such as repeated exposures, they should highly consider PrEP use. So PEP is not a substitute for regular use of other HIV prevention, and PEP is not the right choice for people who may be exposed to HIV frequently. So who should consider PEP? So we have an algorithm on the right side that is very useful. And then on the left, we'll discuss. So people at risk from sexual exposure. So maybe they had a sexual encounter, the condom broke, or their partner also has uncontrolled HIV in that circumstance, they should consider PEP. People who have shared needles, syringes, or other equipment to inject drugs. People who have suffered a sexual assault. So adults who have been referred to MSTH or children who have been referred to the children's hospital and those who have been exposed to HIV at work, so maybe a needle stick exposure. Okay. And then financial support for PEP. So after an assault, a person may qualify for a partial or total reimbursement for medicines and clinical care cost resources. Workplace health insurances or workplace compensation will usually pay for PEP. If the patient cannot get insurance coverage, healthcare providers can apply for free PEP medication through the medication assistant programs run by the medication manufacturers. And some specialty pharmacies with PrEP navigators can assist patients with these medications. All right, next slide. So now we're gonna discuss PrEP billing and coding. So effective last year in October for visits in which PrEP administration and counseling is the primary visit for you should be billing with Z29.81, which is encounter for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. If you're gonna be billing with the code for CAB, which is the top right one, make sure you're billing for the amount that you're giving. So if you're giving 600 milligrams, you need to bill for those 600 units. There's also some codes for evaluation and management. It's also some modifier codes as well at the bottom. So something else to note, um, some providers, I guess, or providers in general, sometimes will use high-risk sexual behavior code, which is Z72.5. That code can be considered stigmatizing in the verbiage. So it is recommended that you use a different code. So Z20 dot, which is contact with and suspected exposure to communicable diseases. Okay, and then next slide, please. So communicating test results. So 
whenever we're talking with our patients about the results we receive, we need to deliver those results privately to the patient for positive results, for those rapid results, explain that you need a confirmatory test. Um, HIV treatment does work. So when HIV is undetectable, it is untransmittable. Also let them know about the rapid start calendar. And for negative results, HIV prevention medication works. 99% effectiveness for PrEP and 80 to 99% effective for PEP. HIV stigma affects well-beings of patients. It's good to note that almost eight, uh, almost 30% of people with HIV are lost to care after diagnosis. And some of that actually has to do with how they receive the news in the first place. So building that rapport and talking with your patients in a very calm and direct manner can really help facilitate and getting them into care or getting them onto PrEP. And HIV is a chronic health condition, not a death sentence. Okay, next slide. In summary, PrEP reduces risk before possible HIV exposure. U equals U, prevents transmission during exposure. PEP reduces the risk after possible HIV exposure. ED PrEP, another option for men who have sex with men. There are financial assistance programs available. Encourage PrEP and PEP to those at risk for HIV and create an LGBTQIA friendly and stigma-free practice. Next slide. HIV Nexus, if you guys haven't heard of it yet, I highly recommend that you guys get on board with it. Comprehensive website from the CDC that provides the most up-to-date scientific evidence on screening for HIV, PrEP and PEP, and treatment guidelines. Next slide. So some more resources on preventing new HIV infections. Um, some materials, which are gonna be listed below, and you'll have access to these materials via email. You'll be able to open up all these links. Next slide. So other helpful courses, National HIV Curriculum, National LGBTQIA Health Education Center. Next slide. And now we have some national resources. So the National Clinician Consultation Center, AETC National HIV Curriculum, and some more links below. Next slide, local resources. So for PrEP, we have the PrEP locator, please PrEP me, DSHS PrEP. There's also the Metro Health PrEP line, which is provided there. For PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, we have the Kime Clinic and Centromed. If either of those two options are not available for that patient, then what's recommended is the full service ED if those clinics aren't available. As a reminder, Metro Health does not have or offer PEP services and some syringe, uh, syringe services as well and substance use treatment and recovery. All right, next slide. Just a list of some references for you guys to go through whenever you all have access to this PDF. And also remember to subscribe to Doc Alerts for health alerts for Metro Health. So